Hallelujah. We honor the Lord today. Amen. We honor the Lord today. We greet you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For he's a way maker. His name is matchless because he's a promise keeper. His name is matchless because there's no other God. And that's a small G-O-D that can meet the ways of our God. Jesus Christ, the way maker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness, the one who died on Calvary, shed his blood for you and me, that we might have the right to the tree of life. We honor the Lord today. We thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We honor the Lord today. We honor the Lord today. We honor the Lord today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We do honor the Lord today for his goodness. We thank God for giving us another opportunity to come into his house of worship. Amen. So many, so many didn't have this opportunity. There are those that are laying in the hospitals, laying in the nursing homes. There are those that are laying in the grave. But look at God. He made a way. And he has brought us and allowed us to come into this place of worship. This sanctuary that we might worship the Lord. We do honor the Lord today. We do honor all of our co-laborers in the gospel. Amen. To the deacons, to the mothers. Amen to all those of you that are in the house of worship today. Amen. We do honor our bishop today in his absence. Amen. We thank God for a true man of God. Amen. He's on assignment. Amen. He's on assignment. And he, he is going to preach the word of God this morning. So we ask that you keep him in prayer. Amen. As he bring forth God's word, that souls might be saved. And that's what it's all about. Amen. It's about the salvation of souls. It's about reclaiming the backslider yes. and encouraging the hearts of those of us that know Jesus. Amen. But we need to be encouraged at times. Amen. Amen. We're not going to prolong the time. Uh, we're going to get directly to God's word. We're going to find us in the book of Daniel today. Amen. Daniel, the fifth chapter. Amen. Daniel, the fifth chapter. We're going to begin at the first verse. And we will read Daniel 5, 1 through 5. And then we will jump down quickly to the 25th fifth verse. Amen. Put my eyes on so I can see. Amen. Amen. Daniel, the fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse, and it reads, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his prince, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his prince, his wives and his concubines drank therein. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of silver. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, 
and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the print of the hand that wrote. Quickly, verse 25. And it reads, And this is the writing that was written. Many, many, to kill you farce. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. To kill, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Fierce, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Our subject is going to come from Daniel 5 and 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's house. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Amen. And we're going to talk briefly from the subject, the handwriting on the wall. The handwriting on the wall. We're living in a day and time where the things and the symbols of God are taken for granted. There was a time when we were coming to the house of God with great reverence, great respect, looking for God to move like never before. There was a time when we would walk through the doors and we had great expectations of what God would do. We didn't know exactly what it was he was going to do, but we recognized that there was a power greater than either one of us. And we realized that it was the Holy Spirit that would be doing the work. So we reverence God. Amen. We reverence his house. Right. We reverence the symbols of God. Now, no, we didn't worship them. But we understood that the communion table represented Amen. the shed blood of Jesus. So we didn't just toy with it. We recognized that the pulpit was a holy place where the anointing of God would move upon the man, the woman of God, that stood behind the holy desk to preach or to speak the words of God. We recognize that the man or the woman of God may be just a simple man or woman, but at that moment, they were a symbol, or they were a token, or they were someone that God would begin to use. The words that came out of their mouth was not their own words, but it was the words that was being dictated to them from heaven to earth to his people. So we entered the house of God with great respect. Ah, there was a time where we as children, I remember, how well do I remember, that we would sit next to our parents or next to our grandparents or we sat next to the deacons or the mothers and if we just started to look like we was about to cut up, we got slapped. Yeah, how I remember those days. And it wasn't as the world, the society states it, 
They stated as abuse. They saw it back then as raising the children. They saw it back then as teaching the children to respect. They saw it back then that they put the fear of God in us. That when we came into the house of God, we didn't use it as a playground. We didn't use it as a toy. We didn't take the Holy Bible and just went through it and used it as a toy or a regular book. But we reverence those things that belong to God. But we're living in a time where folk just take God for granted. They take the things of God for granted. They come into the house of God like it's just a regular house. They look and carry themselves in your way. They walk in dressed in your way. Now I know that it has nothing to do with our clothing because God looks upon the heart. But one thing for certain, if it's on the inside, it's coming out on the outside. Ah, I know you don't like that, but if the Holy Spirit is on the inside, then the Holy Spirit will begin to teach you and train us in what to do, what not to do, what to wear, what not to wear, how to carry ourselves, what to say, and what not to say. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. Uh, he's a God. He shows us. Ah, uh, many times the old folks, they take us back. And I look and I say, Lord, if we could just go back. Go back to the old landmark. Go back to where God first took us. Remember from whence we have come. For the Bible tells us that we have fallen short and we've fallen from the ways of God. Yet, there was a time when we reverenced the things of God. Uh, the house of God was created or was built so that we can worship God. It was a place that the children of Israel came and they would come and they would pray unto God. They would worship God and they looked for God to move. The first temple was built and David desired to build a temple. David recognized all that God has done for him. David was a man, a warrior. David had a lot of blood on his hands. But when he was yet sitting down in his house, he looked and said, look at all that God has done for me. Look at all that I have. But God and his things are behind a curtain. I need to build a house for God. Nathan came to him and said to him, he said, your hands are too much full of blood. Should God use you? But to see how precious the house of God was, David, a man after God's own heart, David, a man that was used mightily of God was not allowed to build the house of God. But God said to David, your seed will do it. And he gave David a promise. He said, in thy house and thy kingdom shall be established, David, forever. Thy throne shall be established. Down the line, David's son Solomon right. built the house. And when he built the house, he went and he prayed. And he said, Lord, whenever your people 
Come into this house. Yeah. Hear their prayer. And give them what they desire. God said to Solomon, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, if my people would seek my face, he said, I. Ah. But there's something we got to do. We got to come before God in the way that he desires us to come. Yeah, yeah. Don't just come looking for a handout. Don't just come looking for things and looking for riches and looking for blessings. But come expecting God to save. But if he saves you, then everything else will come. If he delivers you, yeah. everything else will come. So, we're living in the last days. Yeah. Yes. Ah, these are the last days. Yeah. Now, I've heard that phrase. And I'm, certain I'm not the only one. I've heard that phrase. We're living in the last days for years. I'm sure you've heard. And people are taking that phrase for granted. They're saying, oh, they've been talking about the last days since I was a child. And we're not there yet. Well, when you think about it, if they've been talking about the last days years ago, they were closer to those last days than we were back then. Yeah, yeah. But the Bible tells us that. The Bible says this is the wall saw that in the last days perilous time shall come. Yeah, yeah. Have you noticed the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you read the paper? Yeah, yeah. Reading the papers or looking at the news it's like reading your Bible. Oh, God. Oh, my God. If I could just get this out like I feel. We're living in a day and time where anything goes. We're living in a day and time where right is no longer right. Wrong has become right. There is no morals anymore. Anything goes. Anything goes. Do as you want. Have your way. You're your own God. We're living in the last days. And sooner or later, Jesus Christ is going to crack the sky. And he's going to return for those of us that are ready. But in our text, in our text, the striking thing at the beginning of Daniel chapter 5 is the unawareness of the tragedy and disaster on the part of the king and his lords. They don't see. They're having a good time. They're going about what they desire to do. The king decided to have a feast. You see, the background to this is that there was a battle. And Babylon was about to be taken. But the king thought he had it all together. The king thought that he was above God. The king thought that his little God would be over God Almighty. So the king decided, instead of getting prepared for the battle, he decided we're going to have a feast because we got it all together. Ah, sounds like some of us. Instead of getting prepared for the coming of Jesus, 
We got it all together. I got time. I can do what I want to do. Well, the king decided to have this feast. And then to top it off, to yet stand and point his finger in God's face, he told his Lord to go and get the precious gifts, the things in the temple, bring them to us. No longer are we respecting the things of God. Bring them to us. And we're going to drink our wine out of them. We're going to party out of them. So the king began to party and began to drink his wine, began to have a good time. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they saw a hand begin to write on the wall. Nobody was attached to that hand. No arm was attached to the hand. It was just the hand writing words on the wall. Amen. Caught the king's attention. He wanted to know what it was. Now, let's take note here. The king didn't say to them, where's the rest of the body? <laughs> what caught the king's attention What's the word? Ah. Listen. We may not see the body of Jesus Christ personally. Amen. But the writing Amen. is on the wall. God's word stands by itself. If you see his word, if you read his word, and if you don't know Jesus, it should catch your attention. The writing is on the wall. So he called them and he said to them, interpret these words for me. Now, let's go a little bit back into history. Do you remember King Nebuchadnezzar? Yes. And King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Yeah. King Nebuchadnezzar went to his astrologers. Yeah. He went to his interpreters. And he said, I don't remember my dream, but you have an anointing as astrologers. You have an anointing as interpreters. If you tell me my dream and then interpret my dream, I'll make you ruler over the kingdom. They can do it. But there was a man. There was a man who they looked over, who they didn't pay any attention to. They remembered this man named Daniel, who was in the lion's den, laid his head on the lion. And God delivered him. Yes, they called Daniel. Daniel said, keep what you got. But we'll pray and we will bring you the interpretation. Daniel went back. See, that's why it's good to know some praying people. Daniel went back. Amen. And he got sad, right? He got Meshach. He got Abednego. And they begin to pray. God showed Daniel the dream that the king forgot. And Daniel told him what the dream was and the interpretation. But then, like the world usually do, after they get what they want from him, they throw you aside. Amen. They forgot Amen. about that. Amen. They threw them aside. Amen. But when the handwriting was on the wall, yeah. and those astrologers again couldn't give the interpretation, yeah. in comes the queen. Yeah. And she went to the king. And she said, there's a man by the name of Daniel. 
He did interpret for you. Then you came in. Amen. They called you. See, when they want you, when they need you, when they know who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why when we stand before the world, we have to stand with confidence. Yeah. We have to stand in who we are. If we say we're Christians, the world has to know. Because when the world needs deliverance, they know who to call. When the world needs prayer, they know who, they know who to call. They went to death. And they called Daniel in. Daniel didn't take like some of us would do an attitude and say, oh, you need me now? <laughs> no. Daniel recognized who he was a witness for. Daniel recognized who he was standing for. So even though sometimes we feel like we're being used, Recognize that it's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about saving souls. Getting the word out to us. Then you came in. Then you looked at the king. And the king began to mock him. Are you the one that can interpret dreams? They tell me that you interpreted the dream of my grandfather. They tell me that you can do this and you can do that. Sound familiar? They tell me that you are a praying person. They tell me that you can get a prayer through. Oh, they tell me you are a member of so-and-so's church. They tell me, but are you who you say? Because the world is looking at us. The world sees us. We say one thing, but are we living that thing? Can the world see what we are saying? Can they see? Because there's going to come a time when they're going to run to the house of God. And when they run to the house of God, and sit next to you. Can they say, this is the person that I can trust. Then told the king, keep all that you have. For I'm not doing this for fame and fortune. I'm not doing this in order to get things. I'm doing this because God is my supply. And anything that I need, God is going to give it to me. If I do His will, He will meet my need. So then, begin to tell him what it said. And then you said to the king, many, many to kill you first. He began to tell him that your time is up. <laughs> My God. Your time is up on this earth. And your time is up being king of this nation. Ah, me. Your time is up. But then he gave the second minute. And he said, you are found wanting. You was weighed in the balances of justice. You didn't meet up to what it needed to be. You are found wanting. Then he said, you fasted. The interpretation to that is, the kingdom is about to be split. Ah, so yet, even though you took the things of God and used them for your own self, your time is up. Time is up. 
you're partying now. But by tonight, you will be jaded. Ah, so saints of God, what are we saying today? You might be saying that was sermon. What are you trying to tell me? I'm so glad, Jack. I'm saying today that we know not what the next moment will bring. Are we being weighed today in the balances of justice? Are we being weighed according to the word of God? But we don't know our next moment. We don't know when we will leave this earth. But our time is yet being numbered. We wait on the schedule. We wait. And every last one of us sitting here today, including me, are found wanting. How do I know that? But the Bible declares all have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God. All of us are waiting and we come wanting. But the good news, my God, my God, my God, even though I come up short, what can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? What can bring me up to the standard? Not my own doing. Not what I've done. Not my goodness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's all in the blood. Thank God for his blood. The blood that washes me. The blood that brings me up. So today, I, my time might be numbered. I don't know my last hour. I might be wanting. I don't know where I stand. Other than the poor surprise. Thank God for his cross. Thank God that Jesus went to the cross. Jesus looked down to time. He saw that on July 15th, 19 so and so. Fred Furman was to be born. A sinner. A sinner who needed salvation. And even then, he went to the cross for every sin that I committed. Every sin that I will commit. I'm not perfect, but I'm faithful. I'm not perfect, but he shed his blood that I might have life. That we might have the right to the tree of life. I don't come on my own, but when I come to the altar, that precious place, the holies of holies, where Jesus Christ shed his blood and he one of us, he pours the blood. My God, the blood is poured on our heads and it rolls down to our feet. We're covered by the blood. All my sins are forgiven. All that I've done is forgiven. And he cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. Man might remember. Oh, I remember when. I remember when. Remember that party we went to? Remember how you showed out at that party? I remember when. But when Jesus looks at that gate, it's blotted out. When Jesus looks at what we've done and he sees the blood, it's blotted out. So good news is that yes, I might be a sinner, but I'm a sinner 
say my grace. So today, those of you who know not Jesus, the only difference is between you and me is I'm a sinner saved by grace. And you're a sinner in need of grace. That's the only difference. And the moment you say, Lord, forgive me, that moment you're just the same as I am. And I've been saved for almost 50 years. So the moment you accept Jesus Christ, had Belshazzar repented after hearing the word that was given to him, his end would have been different. But he hardened his heart. He hardened his heart and did not repent. And because he did not repent, So today, I encourage you, if you're not saved, I encourage you, if you backslid, I encourage you to come to the altar. Come to Jesus. Song of the old saints used to sing. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus just now. Come to Jesus just now. Then they say, He will save you. Not He might save you. Not we'll think, He'll think about saving you. No, He will save you.
we talk to you. If you never thought about believing in the finished work, in the work that Jesus has done, we're talking to you. For the Bible declares that believing in Jesus Christ, if you believe, you shall be saved. Simple as that. Confess with your mouth. Speak. Believe in thy heart. Believe in what it was done. What are you going to believe? That Jesus died for you? That his blood covers you? And that you're saved. Is there one that know not Jesus? Is there a backslider that has walked away? That's a fancy way of saying backslide. That's a fancy way of saying, eh, now I was saved at one time, but I wouldn't start doing what I wanted to do. And I know it was wrong. The same way as when we were young, or when you was young, and your parents said, don't do this. But you did it. And the back of your mind, you knew that you shouldn't have done it. You backslid from the ways of your parents. So it's the same way. You were saved, you walked away, and now I'm coming home. Come on home. Come on home. Come. Is there anyone that desires prayer? Any saint that desires prayer? Yes, Lord. I heard your word and I want you. I'm not where I should be. And I recognize that I haven't reached my full potential. But I'm getting there. And I know that through your word, your strength, that I will make it. And I'm coming for prayer just for strength. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
shedding your blood for us. Shedding your blood, God, and dying for us. And purchasing us through that blood. For we recognize that you have redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. We've been purchased by you. And our God, you are now our owner. We thank you, God, because we recognize we haven't done it right all the time. But God, your grace, your mercy is always given to us. And we thank you for it. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that we can yet strengthen ourselves through your Holy Spirit. That the world might see you through us. Father, teach us your way. Teach us your word. Teach us how we might live, God. That many women might look upon us and see you, God. Help us to be that light that shines in darkness, God. Help us, God, to be that city that sitting upon a hill, God. That the world, God, might look upon us and might yet see hope in a hopeless generation, in a hopeless world. For we realize, God, that time is winding up. We realize that these are the last days. We realize that, God, things are happening now like never before. But, oh, God, you've made a promise to us. You said that when we see these things, so look up, for our redemption draws nigh. We realize that you're soon to come. And one day, God, you're going to blow that trumpet. And you will receive us unto yourself. Father, help us, God, to yet not be wanting in ourselves. But, oh, God, help us to yet stand on your word and be found, God, precious in your sight. God, we pray, God, for those that know you not in the sins. Save them today, God. Oh, God, we pray that you touch their hearts and that you prick their hearts and that the Holy Spirit would draw them unto you. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will Look upon the backslide. Draw the backslide back to you, God. Let them recognize, oh God, that you still love them, that you care for them, and that you have not turned your back on them. Let God encourage the hearts of the saints. Encourage us, God. Lift us up and bless us. God, let us be witnesses unto you. Let us yet, God, 